we live in the same world, but we live in different worlds. Each of us sitting here right now. We're in the same room. We see many of the same things, but we see them from different angles. And there's a part of our awareness within each of us we don't share with anyone else. You probably remember the time when you were a child when the thought of first occurred to you when other people see colors. Do they see the same colors that you do? We have the same names for certain things. You point to something and say, this is green, and we agree it's green. But is your green the same thing as my green? There's no way we can know. And so we shrug that off as a strange fact. But it turns out that the big problem in life, our suffering, is also in that same area. You go to a doctor and the doctor can't see how much pain you're in. He can guess or she can guess. And they ask, how would you rank your pain on a scale of 1 to 10, which is pretty useless. Because how does your 1 compare to other people's 1 all the way up to 10? Yet yeah, this is the big area in life, our pain, our suffering. This is the big problem. This is why when we meditate, we're focusing on this area of our awareness, the awareness that's inside. We have to take responsibility for it because no one else can take responsibility for us. We get recommendations from the Buddha on what to do from within, but we're the ones who have to do the doing. He says to be. contemplating or keeping track of the body in and of itself. In other words, the body as you feel from within, ardent, alert, and mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. Anything that refers to anything outside of the body, any other context, you put it aside right now. Just the body in and of itself, the breath in and of itself. This is something else that no one else can know. They can hear you breathe. They can watch you breathe. But how your breath feels from within, that's something nobody else can know. But you can use it. You can change the way you breathe, change the way you feel it. Think of the breath going in different ways. And it responds. Sometimes it responds more quickly than other times, but the breath does respond. So you can take advantage of that. You can create a sense of well-being inside. And you gain a sense of the other elements of the body, the warmth, the fire, the coolness of water the solidity of earth. Again, these aren't tactile sensations. They're proprioception, the way your body feels from within. You're trying to anchor yourself here so that you can get a sense of your mind from within. Learning how to observe the mind. So you're not simply in the thoughts that come to the mind. But you can step out of them a little bit and see the thoughts as a process. This is one of the reasons why we focus on the body. It gives you a place to stay. Now to stay here, you want to feel at home. Same way as moving into a house. You want to put up some artwork. You want to put up some the furniture you like. Arrange things so that it's a good place to stay and it turns it into a home. And here you do that with the different elements. First and foremost, it's the breath, because it's the most responsive of the elements. And as you settle in here and watch it, one of the first things you'll notice is if there is a pain in the body, how you envision the way the breath energy relates to the pain. The problem is you may not notice it, so the Buddha has you. Focus here. Breathe in a way that gives rise a sense, to a sense of pleasure, a sense of fullness. And then John Lee gives, gives some added instructions, fills in the blanks. 
if you notice that as you're trying to spread the sense of well-being through the body that you run into a pain, think of the well-being going through the pain. Don't let it be blocked. Don't let it stop there. Don't think of the pain as a wall. Don't think of it as a dead area where the breath can't penetrate. The breath can. The fact that you're feeling something there means that there's already breath energy. But it may be stifled, it may be bottled up, stagnant. So think of what you can to bring it more to life. So the breath flows in comfortably. There's a pain in the body. You ask yourself, which direction is the breath coming into the pain from? Feel a pain in the leg. Is it coming up from the foot or down from the thigh? Have a pain in your back. How does the breath energy relate to that? Is it coming down the spine and going through it? Is it coming up from the legs? Which way of visualizing the breath to yourself is most effective in treating the pain? Because that's one of the advantages of working with the breath, is it can change the way you feel pains in the body. So you can settle in here and feel at home and ready to do the work with the mind. Of course, as you're dealing with the pains like this in the body, you're already dealing with the mind. It's perceptions of the pain. It's way of talking to itself about the pain. But simply here a matter of changing the focus. You're with the breath, you're with the body. But you're also noticing how the mind relates to them, both as an active principle with its perceptions and then as a passive one, simply being aware of what's going on. Because this is the big instigator in this area of reality, which is your area, that you don't share with anyone else. The Buddha said the mind is the forerunner of all things. So how is it shaping things? Is it doing a good job? Bring some awareness to the process. And take advantage of what you can learn about this area of your awareness. Why are you still strong enough? Why are you still alert enough? Why well, you can still hear and see? So you can take in messages from outside, take in Dharma lessons from outside. Because it's not always going to be the case that you can communicate with the world outside. I have a couple of students who are getting deaf as they get older. And communication gets garbled really easily. Unfortunately, they still have enough hearing so they can check if something doesn't seem right. But then something may seem right to them and still be totally wrong. And there may come a point where they can't check. And realize that this could happen to other people and it can happen to you. When the Buddha is talking about being mindful of body externally and the bodies internally, this is one of the things he's having you think about. Having a human body is a precarious proposition. Its inner workings are very complicated and they're so quickly amenable to malfunctioning. So why you got them functioning? Learn to create a space inside where the mind can talk to itself, the mind can reason with itself. The mind can understand itself. I heard an unexpected story the other day. It turns out that back when Nixon was president, he went to Thailand and he had an audience with the king. And as he reported later, one of the questions he liked to ask the different heads of state that he visited was, what would you like from America? And the king gave him an answer that he didn't expect. The king said, understanding. That's what we're here for. We're here to understand. 
because understanding makes a huge difference. That's part of the power of the mind. So if you can understand how the mind creates unnecessary suffering for itself, then you can learn how to stop. So as you're dealing with yourself inside this area of your territory, you can deal in a way that no matter what's happening outside or how much you're able to communicate outside, you've still got something inside where you're dealing with your thoughts, you're dealing with your physical sensations in a way that's not creating any suffering. That's the skill we're working on here. It's in this area right here. This is why the Buddha, when he posed the question, what is one, never said that we're all one. He said something else entirely, all, all beings subsist on food. Because after all, we are not one. There are areas in our environment that we share, that we're all dependent on, where there's a conflict there. Different people have different desires out of the environment and sometimes very easily conflict. But if you focus on the area inside, you don't have to conflict with anybody. No one is going to move into your territory. No one can evict you. It's happened the fact that the body will evict you from the body at some point, but still your inner world, wherever it goes, is your territory. So you want to make sure that it's in order and it's not creating a lot of suffering for itself. Because this inner world has lots of potentials for suffering, but also potentials for happiness. It's in this inner world. When the Buddha talks about touching deathless with the body, this is what he means. It's, from, it's something that will appear in your inner world. There's that possibility, too, right here. So try to stay grounded here as much as you can, sensitive as much as you can. Sensitive not only in the sense of sensing what's going on, but also understanding when something happens, if there's any pain, any suffering, why? What can be done about it? It's amazing that the Buddha focused on this as the big issue of his teaching. Of course, that's because he saw this as the area where the, the teaching was most needed. That problem of suffering. It's right in here. It's nowhere else. Other people have their suffering, but you can't sense their suffering. You don't have to suffer from it. You can suffer vicariously, but the real suffering is what you experience from within. That was the sign of the Buddha's great understanding that he saw that there were common patterns in everyone's inner world. So it was possible to teach people. They saw that this was the big problem that weighs down on the hearts of all beings. He made that the focus of his Dharma. He had found what works, and he wants to share it with us. So it's up to us to open eye, go to bring it in to where the work needs to be done.